Greetings from Vienna, Austria, and welcome to our April MOOC on Trecentes Tosca Best Practices. I am Trang Le, Training Consultant, and with me is Christian Meyer, our Managing Consultant. Christian has been with the company for 10 years and he focuses on rollout and enterprise implementation, therefore a great person to talk about best practices in Tosca. Some of you who join our MOOCs on a regular basis will have heard this many times. But since there are some people joining us for the first time, please allow me to talk about our housekeeping rules. All participants must be muted during the session. As there are hundreds of you currently attending, obviously everyone talking would be confusing and hard to follow. There is a control panel at the bottom of your screen with apps you can toggle on or off. Key ones being Q&A, Twitter, Share, and the media player. Please note, if you pause the media player, we will disappear, so don't do that. Even though you're all muted, we do encourage you to ask questions during the session. Please use the before-mentioned Q&A box. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the MOOC. Therefore, we will hold the most interesting questions for the Q&A session so that everyone can profit from the answers. We will, however, answer as many questions as possible during the session. But please be aware that only questions related to the current topics will be covered. Please keep in mind that, given the number of attendees, we might not be, an be able to answer all of your questions during the session. Lastly, let me state that this session will be recorded and will be shared on our website later this week. And now, here's Christian Meyer. Okay, let's dive into the best practices in Tosca, or at least some of them. So first, I will quickly talk about why we think best practices uh, are helpful and, and a must-have um, when you're using Tosca. Uh, then I will uh, show you our most wanted 10 best practices for today, all around automation, and then we will have time for some Q&A. Okay, um, why do we need best practices in Tosca or, in my opinion, in any other tool? Um, different software um, usually uses different ways or, or gives you different ways of reaching the same goal. Some are more effort, some are less effort, um, but in the end you have the same. So th this is why we define best practices. So you have different options in an application, but we want to see um, the quickest ways of reaching certain goals or the most maintainable ways of, of using a software, right? Especially a, a huge software as the Tosca test suite is. Um, with its different components and different possibilities all around automation and test management. Um, if you use a software outside of those best practices, then maintenance time will be increased um, a lot and you will have more time spent for the same outcome. Here's a quick example. Um, from the Office Suite, you could use Excel that everybody knows for um, creating formatted text, right? It works. Um, you can see here you have different chapters, you have a header, um, which basically looks uh, as formatting uh, um, as in any Word document. But it's much harder to read the same goal um, than if you would simply use Word for that, right? In Word, you have support for form formatting, you have much more space and you have quick sections, navigation, and all that stuff that Word is famous for, for um, formatting text. Stuff that you would never be able to do with Excel um, out of the box. So for Tosca, there's also a, a lot of different ways of doing things and also a lot of ways of doing things wrong. So if you adhere to certain best practices in Tosca, um, you will reduce the maintenance effort drastically. Um, the artifacts that you create will be more readable for everyone, even for beginners or business users that just want to see reports out of your system. Um, the team will much more easily work together. Everyone is using the same rules. Everyone uses the same object types or principles. 
um, to navigate in the software. The automation will be much more stable if you're using certain best practices or principles that we would recommend you to use. Uh, the communication with our support team will be much easier um, because the support team speaks the same language and is familiar to the artifacts and the ways you're using Tosca. Um, the execution time will be increased a lot um, if you're not doing certain things that will slow down the execution and also the creation um, of, of your execution artifacts or the execution list will be much faster when you use certain best practices. Unattended execution, something very important for DevOps today or continuous integration, will be much more stable if you're using certain best practices and the general test case quality will be increased a lot. And last but not least in this list, the tool will be much more fun to use and easier to use for you if you're doing certain things um, the way we would recommend you to use them. This is just a, a, a short list. There is a much more reasons for using best practices or certain processes in Tosca. Okay, for today, I will show you the top 10, in my opinion, of best practices around automation with Tosca. Um, all the best practices are meant for beginners. Um, so um, if you're new to Tosca, I hope um, it's possible to understand all the examples. We will not concentrate on any advanced examples here. The know-how should therefore be based on um, our uh, AS1 certification, the Automation Specialist 1. Um, and should be kind of a prerequisite, so you should have at least a know-how um, after the certification. We cover the basics, more will come. Um, we, we are working on, on creating more and more of those best practices. Um, if you already want more of those um, for more advanced best practices and more details, I would recommend you to look out for our Test Architect 1 training, level 1 training, that goes into those best practices in much more detail than I could show in the in the time today. Okay, enough talk about the why. Let's dive into the first best practice that is, in my opinion, one of the most important ones in Tosca, um, verification points. It is very important that you have at least one verification point for each and every test case that you create. Um, without a verification, you don't know if the uh, system behaved the way um, you want it to behave. Of course, finding a control um, is a test in itself, but you always need to make sure that the test outcome that you expected from a certain scenario is verified, so you can make sure at this point uh, where you have the verification that if it fails, you know why. This is also relevant for test data creation, even if you only want to create test data for later test cases to use, you want to know in this test case that your test data was created correctly and it works for the following test cases. Otherwise, the outcome is not defined and you don't know what to expect, expect in later stages or in the uh, system under test. Let me give you a quick example. Um, I used the, the demo webshop to, to quickly check if the logout functionality works. So um, as you can see here in this test case, first um, I'm logging into the application here. I, I register myself, so I have always a stable uh, test um, um, prerequisite. And then here I click on the logout button, but there is no verification what happens after this logout button click. So if I, if I don't do anything, um, and the application just hangs and does not do a logout, I would not verify that later on the, the application really locked me out. So you could get a, a past result out of this test case, even though the logout did not work. So if you add a verify test step, as I did here in, in, in the demo web shop, as soon as you log out, the, the login button appears again, so you can do a login. Um, you, you verify that the logout really worked and now the test outcome of your test case is really verified and you can make sure that the logout in your system on the test or in this example did work. Okay, I hope this makes sense to you. Um, I think this is a very important best practice and you should even check with uh, queries or whatever to, to 
see how many test cases you have that do not have a single verification step. Okay, let's go to the next one. It's a it's kind of an easy one and more intuitive one. Um, the number of module attributes in your test case. So for readability and maintainability, every module should only hold a certain amount of attributes. So a simple rule of thumb we always train is that you should have as many module attributes as you have, control, uh, as, as you have controls on the screen. But that does not always work because if you have more than 15 or 20 controls on your screen, the module gets unreadable and, and not easy to maintain um, and also not easy to use, right? Because if you, if you want only to click on one link on the screen and you have a, a list of 30, 40 or more module attributes, you will always need to search what you want to do. So if you have many screen elements, then we recommend that you even split up one screen into multiple sub-modules based on the business area that you're working in. Let me give you a quick example. Here we have the, the main, screen, uh, main screen of our demo web shop um, that has a lot of links and link sections on it. Here we have categories, we have manufacturers, popular tags, and we have the newsletter here and so on. So there's a lot of elements on this screen that would, as you can see here, um, have a really huge impact how many modules, uh, module attributes you have in this module. So if you want to verify if one or two links of those are, are okay, it's a, lot of, it's a long list to go through. So we would recommend you to split that up into multiple modules um, where you capture certain sections of your screen, depending on the size of your application, of course. So a rule of thumb that I always use is that you should not have more than 15 or 20 module attributes in one module. Otherwise, it get hard, gets hard to read. In, in the example before, you can see that not even the end of the list was reached and, and we still have more module attributes. It's hard to read and it does not even fit on one screen. So if you split that up, you can uh, even name the modules based on the sections. And with our um, um, find feature in Tosca, the fuzzy search that you hopefully already know, you can more easily find the sections that you want. So uh, as kind of a naming convention, I always use then the, the main page and then separate the sections by a naming convention. Um, for example, the, the categories here, we'll, we'll get a categories tag here, the popular tags that you can see here left, we'll name popular tags. So it should always be easy to read and easy to find. And for those of you who ask the question, why didn't, didn't we use control groups? In this example, we didn't use a, a control group for one because it's an example. And um, for the other, um, we want to verify in this test case that I'm using here if the links are there and, and are correct. And this is in some ways much more easier than with control groups. Okay, let's go to the next best practice. Um, it's something that I often see in, in test portfolios, I, I've worked with a lot of customers and I reviewed a lot of portfolios at customers. And one thing that I always have seen is the test cases tend to be not readable. So you cannot quickly see what a test case do. Which brings me to the next best practice. The module name is unchanged. Meaning when you use a module in your test case, the name is, is taken as, as it, it, it was in the, in the module section which describes the screen or the screen element, um, but it does not describe what you do with this module. So um, here, test cases and their test steps should be always easy to read and even easy to read for a business user or the one reviewing the test cases. Therefore, you should take the time and rename those test steps after you drag and drop the module onto your test case. Uh, a general convention that we're always using is that you use the action that you take in this test step and on which control or controls in the test step the action is taken. Let me again give you a quick example. Um, here, we, we directly use the modules as they are in the, in, in, in the module section. You can even see there is duplicate names. We have main screen. It does not say what I'm doing on the main screen. It says products. It does not say 
what to do with products or, or what the next step is. Then we have again main screen, which with underscore something that we hate um, when we're re 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 reviewing portfolios. And then we have a certain steps that we could find out what it is about, but I think it's very hard to read. So you would never be able to tell which of those test steps do a wait or an input or a verify operation, right? So we cleaned that up and even with some folders, I will uh, talk about folders later on, but each of those test steps has kind of an explanation what happens in this section. Select the book section, add computing and internet to shopping cart. And here you can see enter billing address, enter shipping address. So it's always the action that we're doing. And here in this test step, we also write buffer, order number and verify. And in my opinion, this is much easier to read, even for someone not that familiar with Tosca, than the version before here, where you don't even know where the buffer and verification does happen, or what happens on two different main screens, for example. So I know it's easier if you're quickly creating a test case, or if you have hard deadlines, just to drag and drop the modules or using the fuzzy search quickly adding the modules to a test case, but you will have um, much more effort later on maintaining those test cases, reporting them, or even understand it weeks later what you did in your own test case, if you do not change the names of the test steps accordingly, and in my opinion, also add some folders to separate the sections what you're doing. Here, I, I separated those between the sections that, I, that I'm working in, right? So here it's the main screen where I add certain books to the shopping cart. Here I, I work in the shopping cart directly. And then this section here is all about the shipping, where I go through the different shipping sections, entering the different addresses and the payment and so on. And I think it, it always helps to separate those sections, but I will go into more detail later on that. Okay, I, I hope this was understandable. Let's go to the to the next um, most wanted, in my opinion, um, uh, regarding mistakes people are making when they're creating automated test cases, the so-called static weights. So static weights um, is something that's very easy to do. You just create, use the TC weight module in your test case, put in a time that you want to wait and, and you can, if the, certain, the application has certain loading times, um, you can easily wait for five seconds so the application is loaded. But this approach is very unstable. So you should use static weights or the so-called TC weight module only if it's absolutely necessary. You should use the wait on function instead. If you have a static wait of five seconds and your application one time takes four seconds and one time takes 10 seconds, then in one time with the four seconds, you wait too long, um, which prolongs the execution time of your test cases. This m m might not make a difference for one test case, but for a thousand test cases, each and every second counts um, if you want to execute them in a nightly run, right? Um, and if the application takes 10 seconds instead of those five seconds, then the test case fails again, even though you built this TC wait um, to wait for your application. And this is why we have the feature of the wait on um, um, action mode, where you can wait on until a, a certain control has a certain um, state. So in this example here, you can see I have a hard coded wait in there. So it will wait one second, even though the application, most of the instances will be faster. Um, and if the application for some reason is slower, the test case will fail. And I will need to validate that in my nightly execution why the test case again failed, and I will need to re-execute it. With a wait on, on certain elements here, you can see that um, it waits as long as a certain state is not reached. In this case, we're checking if this shopping cart notification is visible and only then it will go on and verify a certain text or in this case, if, if the control really is visible. So uh, 
just one note on the side, I would recommend even though you have the weight on and it is kind of an implicit um, verification if the control is there, um, for reporting and test purpose I would still recommend using the verify here. But the important part right now is that the wait on is set and that we're waiting for the application as long as it as it needed uh, and not for a specific amount of time that could fail or, or prolong my test case. You can use it in combination. For some, um, in some instances, it might make sense that you um, want to wait a certain amount of time because you know it always takes 20 seconds until the application is loaded and then there is kind of a plus minus um, 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 depending on the day the system is in um, and the load that how many users are on the system or whatever. Um, but the important part is that if you're using a static weight please always combine it with, with a weight on um, after the static weight so you can make sure even if it takes a little bit longer the test case still can run through. And one thing that I also want to point out, um, because some people tend to use loops um, when the wait times are very long with wait on commands, um, which again is, is too much effort in my opinion and not stable enough. So you should try to tweak those synchronization timeout times that, that are shown here and set them higher if needed so you can prevent using those loops with multiple wait ons. For example, here the wait on is set to uh, 10,000 milliseconds, which means 10 seconds. If your application wait, uh, needs 15 seconds, then of course the normal timeout will appear. And the wait on period is 20 seconds, so if you need 25 seconds, even the wait on would fail. And because the wait on here, in this, with this setting, waits a maximum of 20 seconds. So some people create a loop for that and, and loop through the application. Um, uh, until the application is there, but I would recommend using the, the uh, timeout feature here and um, increase it to a minute or something so that the wait on uh, alone works and you're waiting the amount of time the application needs. Okay, let's go on to the next best practice. Um, this is something about um, unattended execution, continuous integration, and stability of your test cases, which is the send keys and the, the uh, click functionality in, in braces. So those are just two examples of ways to use direct keyboard or mouse operations um, to steer your application. And you should only use those if absolutely necessary. Um, Tosca supports, um, for example, for um, um, web automation, that direct events are fired, click events and stuff like that, so that keyboards and mouse operations are not necessarily needed. So you should only use them when necessary, um, because it takes longer to move the mouse or to send input than to directly um, 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 run the click method or click event of, of a certain functionality, which will be much faster and much more stable. Here are some examples. You can see um, um, here on the card button, add to card, is, is um, clicked by using the click uh, method or, or click command, which is a, a mouse functionality, right? The mouse needs to go there and needs to directly click on it. So instead of that, you should always use X, which, which is um, executing the event, which is not possible on all controls, I know, and there is, for example, some people using the span control for um, doing some input operations. And if, if the input is not supported, like click uh, X, then you need to use the click instead. You should prevent it as often as possible, and you could even think about a customization um, for certain controls that you often need to make it possible to directly click on it with events because it will increase your performance uh, a lot. Okay, here's uh, another send keys example. Um, in this case, in an edit box, there are send keys used. Even though it's not necessary in this case, I often see the, the, the uh, um, in, in portfolios that people don't know that you can directly write smartphone into the value instead of sending send keys there. 
and using send keys will always be um, um, much more unstable than, than just directly putting the, the smartphone text into this control. The same goes below here. Um, instead of sending the enter send key here, you could simply click on, on, on such elements. Instead of that, you can see here it even reduces complexity. This is the same test case, um, just using direct control steerings. And if, if you compare those two, you can directly see it's much more easier to read. Um, um, sorry, wrong direction. Much more easy to read this test case and, and it will also be much more stable. Okay, let's go to the next one, loops. This is a, a thing that I have often seen that instead of doing different test cases, people loop through tables and, and creating very uh, complicated loops with if statements and counters. Um, but this is not the way Tosca should be used. Loops should only be used if absolutely necessary. Um, and if you need to iterate uh, through something, then you should use the repetition feature. I will show that in a moment. Um, loops is always like coming from programming. Um, people that created sc scripts um, for automation are used to them. But this is not the way that Tosca should be used. There is better ways of handling Tosca, especially when it comes to tables, um, where people tend to loop through instead of using our constraint functionality. Um, as you can see here, we have a product table in the in the demo web shop and here this is one example of such a loop there is a counter set at the beginning um, there is always calculated the counter plus one um, there is a condition checked if the row count is is smaller as our counter as the the, the row number sorry and then there is an expression uh, evaluation that checks if the row number is smaller than the counter and then here it picks the table and verifies if the name is health and if if the condition here, which is an if statement, um, is health, then it clicks on it and otherwise it, it waits for three seconds. Um, so, oh sorry, otherwise um, if, if we find the right element, the counter is reset so the, the, the loop is, is um, um, finished. So. This looks more like programming and is even hard to read for me, although I created it. Um, as you can see, I made a mistake at the end. So this is not easily maintainable. And in, in when you execute the automation, it will be much longer than, than our preferred way of doing things. And this is something that for some people along, for using Tosca for a long time may sound ridiculous, but I've seen this in almost every project when people try to start with Tosca and find out that we have loops and if conditions in Tosca. The right way of doing it is simply using our constraint feature here to constrain a certain product, right, that's called health in this case, and then just click in the same um, row on the remove button. So this will be not, not only is it easier to read, much easier to read, it will be much faster. Here you have a comparison between those two ways of doing things. On the left side you have the loop thing and on the right side you have the, the version with the constraint. And I think it speaks for itself that, that the preferred way of doing things is with the constraint and not by looping through a table uh, and find anything here. Okay. If an iteration is needed and there are some rare instances where it is needed, then you should not use loops with a condition and, and uh, as I just have shown you. You should use the repetition feature that you can see. There's a specific folder for that here on the left side where you can see the, the iteration sign. Um, and this is just looping through something where the counter is automatically in the background um, increased one time. Um, so it's very easy to use this repetition feature and makes sense if you want to iterate through um, a table, for example, to click the right button to go to the next page for the table or something like this. So for tables, you can use the constraint, but if you want to loop through something where you need multiple clicks, 
switching pages on a table or something like this, then this repetition feature is the way to go. Um, if you need more details on the feature itself, here is the link or you can quickly search um, for repetition in our manual, then you will see more details about how to create such repetition folders and how to use them. Okay, let's go to the next number seven. Um, one of my favorites um, is if usage. It, it's close to, to the loop usage and close to the fact that many people at the beginning try to use Tosca as a programming tool or a scripting tool, um, which it, it isn't. Um, Tosca creates test cases on a very sophisticated level automatically for you in terms of how you can scan the controls and how you can use um, um, constraints on tables and stuff like that. So there's only rare instances where if statements, where you need to decide in which direction you want to go, um, are really um, um, useful or even needed. So in general, if statements should only be used in preparation sections of your test case or cleanup sections. The test case content, where you really do the steps that your application needs for a certain test or that you go through your system on the test, in, in those sections, you should not have any if statements. If you have, and you will see this in the next example, um, I created one, one quick um, um, test case with some if statements in there. It's already hard to read um, because you have many different situations that you don't know when you get there in, right? So, so you don't know when you will hit this if statement because it has a condition already up there. Then you have again a condition, then you don't know do you go into the then or else statement and so on. So it's already unclear which outcome this test case has for which input, right? We have a condition uh, uh, on A and B. So you need to make sure if you execute this test case, which input you provide for this test case. Is it A or is it B? And then it will go a completely different way. So here you can see the, the float diagram, the control flow diagram for this test case already. And I only used three or four if statements. And you can already see it looks highly complicated. And now if you execute your test case and mostly by random chance you get A as an input, then it will go this way here, right? If it's the other input, then you go the other section. But how would you know if you execute the test case one time, which way it went through, and if the behavior of this way is the expected one? There even could be a bug that if you input B, that it goes the other way around. Sorry, wrong direction in my slide deck. So there could even be a bug that if you input B, that it still goes the way of A, something like this here, and not the direction B, and the test case would still pass. So if statements breaks the, the general law of test cases that for a defined input, there must always be a certain output and not different directions it can, can go through. It not only increases your maintenance if you're using if statement, it also um, very much increases um, the way you can read test cases and your test case outcome. So if you even have one test case in your test case, you already have two different possibilities. This test case could pass or fail, and you will never know which one. Uh, okay, sometimes people then execute the test case two times and first preparing the application in a way that, that always one of the scenarios is hit, but that's much too much effort uh, and it's error prone. So this is not the way we want test cases. Each test case should only have one defined goal and then if it runs through and anything is different than before, then the test case should fail. So. Therefore, we have the test case design to create different variations of a test case very quickly, uh, different input values and also different verification values. But each of those test cases has a defined path. It's different variations and therefore different test cases. So as you can see here, the happy path here has a different, has a specific set of data. And here our product two has just different input data and will behave a little bit differently 
but it's a different test case. And if you execute product two, it will always behave as product two and there will be no different ways to go through the application. So in, in the blue section, this will recede in different test cases, no if statements in there, and will you can execute all four of them. All four of them are pretty similar. It's the same process, but they're just going different ways in the same uh, in uh, different ways in the application and taking slight detours in our process, um, but they're all from the same template, so they are easy to maintain and there is no need for any if statements. So there is rare instances where if statements make sense. Um, for example, in recovery scenarios, recovery scenarios um, is something that we recommend you to use to make sure test cases that fail um, create a certain stable um, 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 scenario for your next test case. So if you run 10 test cases and the second one fails, we want the other one to, to be able to run through. And in those recovery scenarios, or in this case, a cleanup scenario inside uh, th those recovery scenarios, we want to make sure that if the user is um, um, locked out, that uh, locked in, that we lock him out, so that the next case, the next test case, can start with a stable login and does not have um, in the Internet Explorer have already a user that is locked in. So this is one scenario where an if statement makes sense because in our recovery scenarios. We do not care if, if um, the test focus is met or if our system on a test is, is, is tested. What is important is that we clean up and that our application is in a state um, that we want it to be at the next test case. So this is one of the rare instances where if statements could make sense. Um, it depends, of course, on the use case, but I would not recommend them using them in the direct um, test case content, as I've already said. If you have pre-processing or prerequisite steps in your application, starting the application, for example, then you can also use if statements to check if the application is already started and if the application is not started, start it. This would, would also be a rare instance where it makes sense to have it, um, in, as I said, only in preparation steps or in cleanup or post-requisite steps, not in the content itself. Okay. I hope this made sense because using if statements is one of the main reasons um, repositories or portfolios are getting unmaintainable very quickly um, and they should just not be used. Use the test case design or Excel as an input data source for your test cases instead of using if statements um, because it, it will just not make sense and you have only one test case where it should be two or more. Okay. Number eight, um, top level test steps. I just um, I glanced it a little bit in, in the previous um, um, best practices um, and it's a very easy one and I think a very intuitive one. Um, the test cases you create should be all about readability and, and maintainability. And if you have a certain amount of test steps on top level of your test case, then it can be hard to read. Um, so if you have more than let's say 10 test steps, it could be different for, for different scenarios. You should use top level folders to separate your sections um, between a prerequisite where you do the, the preparation, set buffers where you initialize your buffers for the application or reset them, where you start your system on the test and where you load your test data, for example, from our uh, test data management or the TDS, the new test data management service. Um, then you should have a folder for the content, which is the real content of your test case, um, where you test your system on a test and navigate through the application. And there should be a post requisite folder, which is kind of the cleanup stage and um, the, where you can close the system on the test. And, and write back to the test data management the results of your test, the new state, and so on. So um, here's an example for, of a test case that only has 15 steps that is already relatively hard to read and to see where is the prerequisite part of the application, where is the postrequisite part where you want to close and clean up 
um, and where is the real test content. And therefore, we would recommend to separate those into folders because the folders alone, as you can see here, is already easy to read and you don't need to read through all the test steps to see in which section you are. And you can see here we have this prerequisite folder that is all about open the application, register and log in. Then we have the content here um, where we do the real test. We add the books to our shopping cart and we remove certain books from our shopping cart, whatever. And then we have a post requisite se section for the cleanup. And if you expand those sections, it's still the same test steps, but it's much easier to read and separate it into certain sections. And one thing is very important, when you have those sections and folders, it's much easier to create reusable test step blocks out of it that you can re later reuse in different test cases. I will quickly show you this feature live in Tosca. So here you can see I have Tosca and I have a certain um, test case. Let's scroll there. Let's go here. Sorry, I already prepared it here. So here you can see there's a test case um, that I have a prerequisite folder, content and pro post requisite. And especially the prerequisite will be something that you will need often, right? You need to open the application and register. So for different applications, you will have the same prerequisite. So with an easy click here on this button here, create re reusable test set block parameters, it will automatically create a reusable test set block for those steps fill it with the reusable test step blocks parameters that you used in your application and you have a an, an reusable test step block automatically created with all the data that you need. So without those folders it's still possible but it's just much harder to do so and to create those folders out of specific section that you want to reuse. Okay. Um, I hope that helped. Um, number nine uh, is image-based recognition. Um, if your application is not out of the box easily steerable, it, it sometimes is very easy to use image-based recognition for automation. But in general and on, on a big picture scale, we would not recommend to use it, which I think is obvious. It's uh, not that stable. Um, it's not that maintain not easy to maintain um, compared to to direct um, control finding and event based steering and so on. Um, the readability is is not that easy because you have different control types and so on. And for unattended execution, if you have a locked screen, the controls will not be rendered by Windows those pictures, and then it could be an issue automating them. So this is why we, we sh you should use any UI engine or image-based recognition only in rare instances, for example, to do certain preparation work that, that would be a high effort to, to customize or, or to automate, um, but not as a general um, a way of automating your test cases. Tosca um, gives you much more in advanced features for automation. Um, so last but not least, number 10, unique test case name, which may seem unnecessary or even um, obvious, whatever. Um, but I have seen in many reviews that test cases are not named according to what they really do and what kind of variation out of a, a, a big um, um, set of test cases one singular test case is. So. It's very important, especially in larger environments or when you're growing, that each of those test cases have a unique name. So in your complete portfolio or if, you, if you're using component folders to, to separate different projects, you always need to make sure that the test case in there is unique and that if you report them in a, in a simple list or something, you could read by the name of the test case what the test case does and what it is for. Otherwise, um, for example, here you can see nobody will know what those three test cases do. It may even be very useful what they're doing, we just don't know because the name does not say a thing. And it, it may seem ridiculous, but I have seen this in a lot of portfolios that nobody cared about naming those 
and they execute them on a daily basis and they work, but you never know what those test cases are about. So you should always name them based on what they're doing and in which application they're doing or whatever is the, the best practice for your project. The important part is that this name is unique. In some projects I've seen that there are certain um, numerical conventions where a set of numbers specifies in which application, which process and which sub-process and which data variation they are and so on. So anything that works for your project, but it must be something that everyone in a project can read, um, especially um, business users that are, did not create the test case. Um, so it must be easy to understand for the project members and it must be unique. Okay, those were my uh, top 10 best practices for today regarding automation and test case creation. Um, I hope you could take something out of it um, and um, we will update you regarding other best practices. And again, want to iterate that we already created uh, the test architect training level one that has much more of those best practices and much more detail. Um, again, we only have one hour today, so the training is uh, multiple days. Um, so there is much more to come and much more available for you. Um, as a last input, I just want to point out that it's important not to follow those best practices blindly. Um, you should take out of it um, what you can and tweak them a little bit based on your project's needs, um, but you should not ignore them. You can improve them, you can change them a little bit, but um, we have long years of experience behind that, so it makes sense to use them if you want to have a maintainable portfolio. Um, but again, for each project, it's a little bit different, so, so tweak them, but don't ignore them. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Let's move on to answer some questions. I already have a couple of them from the viewers with me for you. First of all, I try to use wait on, but it always stamps out. Is there another way to wait for the control without using static wait or changing the settings? Okay, yeah, it's, it's a good question actually. So there is possibilities that you on, on each module um, you, you could use a, a wait before or a wait after because there are certain situations where each screen you need to wait, right? Um, a, a static wait is something you need to add to each test case in each test step where you need it or um, the wait on also is something that you need to add manually for each test, steps where, test step where you need it. Um, but with those wait before and wait after on module level, you can decide to wait for a certain control always a certain amount of time or a certain state of this control. Um, for example, with the wait before feature, you can wait uh, on a certain state that a control is in before the steering starts on those controls. If I have defined one recovery in my test case, one in my test case folder and one in the folder above, which one will be run during execution? Or do they all run in a queue? So it would all would running as, as long as, as all of them are failing. So it goes up in the hierarchy and picks the first one and tries this recovery scenario. And if this recovery scenario does not work or fix the application, then the next one would run. Um, yeah, that's it basically. Okay, and I have another question, the last one here. Is it better to use IF or TCD? What are the benefits of using TCD? Okay, so again, I, I talked about IF um, use it um, and why you should not use IF statements and you should use the test case design instead. So if you have one process um, that has different sub variations out of it, different input variations or different steps that you need to take in the application, although it essentially is the same process, then you should use the test case design to, um, on a high level, on an abstract level, 
um, define those different um, variations out of your test case. And this is the red section, the test case design, and the blue section in Tosca always defines the steps that you need to take for a certain variation out of that. So um, instead of copying, hard copying certain test cases, um, which would lead in, in a maintenance issue, right? If you copy one test case and you then need later on to change it because your application changed, you need to change two test cases instead of one. And the usage of test case design and the so-called templates that will be specified in more detail in our AS2 training, um, um, you can make sure that you have one template that you need to maintain. So it's a kind of a singular test case. And then you can create multiple variations out of it um, based on the content in the test case design, or even Excel would be supported. And if, you, if something changes in the application, you only need to change the template and then the test case variations out of it would be automatically updated, which is a huge maintenance um, 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 benefit. And also it's easier in terms of test case design to see which variations you already have because it's much easier to read and more compressed and abstract the data that you see there than all the steps that you need in one test case template. Wow, thank you for your answers and thank you for the book today. Thanks, I hope it helped. Before we end the session, I would like to remind you of our upcoming MOOC, which will cover managing test data with the new test data service. The session will be on April the 25th, 2018. As always, we will have two sessions to cover different time zones. Also, we would kindly ask you to please complete the feedback at the end of the session. If you have any further question or inquiry not covered in this MOOC, please contact our support or training department as well as the knowledge base at support.tricentis.com. We can also be reached on social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you for tuning in and we hope to see you next time.